Hello and welcome everyone to our fourth and final day of the Afghan summit. I'm Prema Rahman. I'm the policy analyst for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Today's discussion will be very important and I personally have my pen and notepad ready to learn from our wonderful panel. However, before we get into today, I would like for all of you to know that all these panels are being recorded and they will all be available, in fact, the last three are, on the MPAC National YouTube channel. Furthermore, we're creating a report that summarizes all these panels that will be available over the next few days. If you're interested in receiving a copy, please email hello at mpac.org. That's hello at mpac.org and include Afghan Summit in the subject. Moving on to today, I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, Medina Wardak. Medina is a uh, mental health social worker of Afghan descent based in Los Angeles. She studied political science with an emphasis on the Middle East and clinical social work. She's passionate about accessible mental health resources for the Swana and Mina community and regularly engages in dialogue on her digital platform, Burkas and Beer to deconstruct taboo and provide education on issues pertaining to the Swana region and diaspora. Without further ado, welcome Medina. Good morning, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm very excited for this panel and also the amazing panelists um, that we have on today. They're really experts in this field. Um, so I will go ahead and introduce our three panelists. Dr. Azira Hatif is a media researcher and, professional, and professor of journalism studies at Emerson College. Her scholarly interests focus on issues of social media as activism for underrepresented groups, gender and identity, and media systems in a global context. She teaches in the areas of ethics and global journalism, where her work focuses specifically on questions related to identity, belongingness, and representation. She has traveled to Afghanistan, writing about the beauty industry post US led invasion. More recently, she has written about the development of independent media in Afghanistan and the representation of Afghan women in US media. We're so excited to have you, Azita. Ali Baluch is an Afghan American filmmaker based in Los Angeles. He is also a writer's assistant at HBO Max and an associate producer at MTV. Thanks so much for joining, Ali. And uh, Ariana Delawari is an Afghan American filmmaker, musician, activist, and graduate of USC School of Cinematic Arts. In 2002, Ariana found herself on a plane to Afghanistan for the first time and began a 10 year documentation of her journeys and the making of her first album. We Came Home is her award winning feature length direct directorial debut, which was released digitally by Time in 2018. Ariana was a performer and speaker at the inaugural TEDx Kabul. She also started a grassroots peace initiative called Inspire Peace. She also wrote and directed a short surreal docu-musical film that accompanies her second album, both called Inteliki, and co-created an app called Afghanistan Connect with Afghan female coding students. Ariana is currently working on her fourth album. So we definitely have a lot of heavy hitters on this call. Um, so today we're going to be talking about narrative building as it pertains to Afghanistan and also the Afghan American diaspora. The recent withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan and the Taliban takeover has pushed this topic in American media. How our narratives are curated and presented is a concern for most of us, especially considering the long history of Orientalist depictions of Afghans and Afghanistan. The Pentagon and the Department of Defense has a deep relationship with Hollywood, what some scholars dub the military entertainment complex. So think of movies like Lone Survivor, Zero Dark Thirty, and Top Gun. Media like uh, recent, the recent sitcom United States of Al, and also the recent announcement of the Tom Hardy Channing Tatum film about soldiers who returned to save Afghan allies is a reminder of the systems that we're up against when attempting to control our own stories. We also learned that Sharbat Gula, the subject of the Afghan girl taken by Steve McCurry, was relocated to Rome, to Rome. While the subjects of McCurry's photographs are seeking asylum and have refugee status, Mr. McCurry is able to have museum exhibits offered to him in galleries in Paris. While there is, you know, a lot of Afghan uh, photographers, photojournalists, and vloggers um, who, who are also working in this field. 
these photos go for thousands of dollars and Afghans will likely not see any of these profits. But at the same time, all of this presents a very unique opportunity for us as well. Um, and in terms of being solution focused, there's a lot that we can discuss. So with all of that being said, I wanted to start off um, with Azita. In your recent article titled, How Photos of Afghan Suffering Shown Over and Over Perpetuate Inequality and Harm, you talked about the 18 year media ban that prohibited photographs of returning coffins of American soldiers. And you also wrote that hiding the suffering and deaths of some from public view while showing others creates a value system in which certain lives are viewed as more valuable and worthy of respect and recognition. I was um, talking to all three of you last night about how even on like our parents' timelines on like Facebook, we'll see the constant like resharing of Afghan bodies. Uh, but we don't really see the same when it comes to American soldiers. So can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be in conversation with everyone here today. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, like most people, of course, I was glued to my telephone, of course, trying to get a hold of family, a family in Afghanistan and, you know, uh, just all these uh, paying attention to media, what was taking place on TV and, you know, all of that. Um, as the withdrawal was, of course, unfolding in August, where it seemed like every media outlet was hyper concerned with what was taking place in Afghanistan. And collectively, we bore witness to Afghans falling to their debts as they held on to the side of airplanes that were leaving Kabul. And while this really demonstrated the sheer desperation of this moment, how these images were shared throughout media with little care or context raises these really important questions about whose bodies are worthy of dignified debts and why we seem to so casually view some of these debts too. Uh, in this specific moment, I couldn't help but draw parallels to this famous falling man photograph, which captured a man who was jumping out of uh, the twin towers, uh, falling to his death, of course, as the um, towers are collapsing on 9-11. And while this photograph, of course, received mixed response from the public, there was overwhelming agreement that it was a bit tasteless and it deserves more context and care when being viewed. So the question, of course, becomes, you know, why do we remove some images from public view, suggesting that they deserve more care and to be viewed in places like museums, whereas the suffering of others is broadcast repetitively with very little care. And so over 20 years of presenting Afghans through these orientalist frameworks makes it easy to see our suffering as imminent and inevitable. Describing the tragic event, many journalists refer to the people who were falling from these airplanes as simply dots in the sky, right? And such dehumanizing language, unfortunately, is on par for how it is that Afghans have been represented in media for the past few decades. And so the ease with which these images circulated online and through broadcast reinforce these systems of dominance, right, that dictate which lives are grievable and which are for the consumption of others. And so when we saw this point really be exemplified with the attack at the airport that killed at least 169 Afghans and 13 US soldiers um, a few days after, um, of course, uh, Kabul was captured. And so the headlines focused on US troops and if there are any images of US soldiers, it was oftentimes respectful and somber or showing them before the, you know, or outside of their work in the military um, in these complex lives. However, even with the focus on US troops, coverage oftentimes included Afghans in a state of suffering, uh, carrying people off on stretchers, families gather around lifeless bodies. And so Afghan suffering year after year, uh, part of this war has become so normalized with the media coverage. And this, of course, creates significant issues for those of us who are working to change that situation as we attempt to dismantle that rhetoric and the, the journalistic practices that have come to primarily represent Afghans. So we see that there are these inequalities in how it is that certain types of bodies are able to be seen in such a state of suffering over and over again and how that has become so normalized and the challenges of undoing that too. Thanks so much for, for kind of elaborating more on that. I think often, um, I, I mean, I can just only speak for, for myself and like my family, we've become, us as Afghans, like we've also just become so desensitized to that and we're so used to kind of seeing that. Um, so when I read your article, that was really eye-opening for me to be like, wow, it's true. I don't necessarily, especially when you talked about the actual media ban, right? That there was 
there was enough understanding to be like, maybe we shouldn't show this, but it's completely fine, you know, to show Afghan bodies. Um, so considering all of that, we have Ariana here who, you know, has been an actress. Um, and I know that, you know, when you've been working in Hollywood and just all of the years of experience that you've had, you've also come across a lot of represent a, a lot of barriers when it comes to representation, how you're going to be represented, how, um, you know, kind of your managers, the, the stuff that they pitch for you or that they did pitch for you. And then also your agency when it comes to how you're being represented in Hollywood. So you shared a couple stories with us last night, which were um, really interesting to hear. Do you mind talking about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I started acting when I was four. I didn't tell you guys this last night, but my acting career started in um, the opening of the Los Angeles Theater Center. It was a play called Nanawatai, and it was directed by William, uh, written by William Master Shimon. And, um, and it was, I was four and I played a little girl who lost my arm from a Soviet planted toy bomb. That was my first experience as an artist and my first experience on a stage while my neighbors deciding to use a hammer on the day that we're recording. Um, that was my very first experience on a stage. So it set the stage of all my art was this war, that, that war. <laughs> Um, and I just, things are changing a lot in terms of Hollywood and acting, like, like in front of the screen representation, but throughout most of my career, um, there was like, there was nowhere to put someone like me. It was like, my managers would pitch me as Latina, which I remember just thinking was such a joke. Like why there's all these Latina artists in LA, why have they cast me? They shouldn't cast me, you know? And it was like, then when 9-11 happened, it was like, oh, you're, you, you know, you're reading for the terrorist's best friend who helps him, you know, change his mind or the terrorist girlfriend or um, terrorist girlfriend I wouldn't do. There was like a few where I was like, nope, that, I'm not doing that. Um, but it got really old. And um, I, when I'd be like, can I read for the lead for this part? It was like, no, they want someone who isn't ethnic. And I was just like, this is, you know, and, and it, it, it's hard because then I talk to like a Caucasian friend or I shouldn't say Caucasian, but like a white friend that's like, um, oh, really? But like, you could just, you know, like they just did it because they're not having the experience. They don't realize like what the oppression is. And so it was really, it was, it was hard. And I finally got to this point where, look, I, I've had amazing, you know, team and people that have been supportive, but just like the system was so jacked that I got to this point where I was in Kabul in like end of 2005. And I, am that year I had booked so much, like I was on the Sopranos, I was on Entourage, like all these shows that are like, you know, an actor is like great, you know, and I felt sad and I'm in an IDP camp in Kabul and these these little girls like look like my cousins and I, and they have such a hard life. And I was like, you know what? You went to film school and you're a musician. Like, why are you waiting to book a part in a story that's likely not representing you at all? And you're doing hours of homework and hours of castings and, and you're just, and you, it's, I'm, you're not just an actress. You have these other artistic tools and it changed. After that, I was like, I'm making an album, I'm making a film. And then once I was making my album, you know, which I made partly in Kabul and then um, finished it in LA with the filmmaker, David Lynch and American bandmates. We started in Kabul with three Ustads, one who passed recently. Um, and that was so deeply fulfilling. And actually what I didn't tell you guys last night is as I was in pre-production for that album, I get a phone call to meet with Brian De Palma in New York. Like I had done a cat, I'd done a reading and he, and the, the, my agent was like, he wants to meet you in person. So I'm like, okay, I go to New York and it's a film about rock. And I sit in that room for two hours reading with all these actors. And I left the casting and my agent called and was like, how'd it go? And I was like, it went really well. And I hung up and started bawling. I'm in New York and I'm like, 
oh my God, what if I book this part? It conflicts with the recording of my album with my people. Like, what, what am I going to do? I didn't get the part. And I'm so glad because look at what's happened to Afghanistan. Like that album, like that moment I had was so much more important. I saw the film and was like, it doesn't represent Iraqis. It doesn't represent anything. Like, no offense, Brian De Palma, but like an Iraqi should have been telling the story. And so these kinds of things have been happening. As a filmmaker, I shared with you that like, you know, I kind of just gone completely independent because for me, you know, it's not that I won't expand to that, but I was like, develop my voice independently so that I have control over the narrative. And even then, I was trying to get rights to my own interview about my music, was told that piece is political. I was up for an award for a best feature documentary, was told at uh, Al Jazeera Doc Fest, was told, oh, the reason why you didn't get it, one of the jurors, like, your film wasn't anti-American enough. It was just like, who, how do I win here? And so it's just a lot. And it's just on the flip side, I was telling you, Medina, I've had a lot of wonderful mentors like David Lynch was like, and his wife, Emily, like the most incredible allies and, and supportive people I could ever meet in my whole career. And that's a huge gift. So it's been mixed. Yeah, we were talking about, you know, how it's like, okay, there's we want this representation, but at the same time, the stories are told the way that it's like manufactured and the way that they want to hear our stories. Um, and Ali, you were talking about how like there are not enough Afghans in like these writers rooms um, and just kind of your experience with that. And, you know, just do your experience with folks wanting to manufacture a certain narrative about yeah. Afghans. Yeah, you know, um, when we talk about the Afghan American narrative or just the Afghan narrative. It, it's a whole spectrum of things, if, especially if we're looking at media collectively, right? So if we look at it through, a, you know, like a, a very journalistic uh, uh, lens and look at it through like panels or these, um, uh, what are they called? Those CNN pundits, you know, that, that come into, especially the last like what, four, five, six months. It's just been nothing but like white experts speaking on Af Afghanistan. We have Afghan scholars, academics, professionals, government officials. We have the whole, right? Everything that these white people are, we have that within like that professional experience of Afghans. Plus they have the additional bonus that they are Afghan and they have that uh, understandings, uh, you know, that cultural understanding as well. So, you know, I, I think before we got started, I was joking, I was like, I do not, like, I'm so tired of white men just saying, pronouncing Afghanistan the way they say it. I just don't want to hear the name Afghanistan come out of another white man's mouth for the, you know, uh, moving forward. Because, I mean, if I want to hear about the geopolitics, what's happening, um, what failed, what political strategy, I want, I'd rather hear it from an Afghan expert. And we have those individuals, but we get overlooked because who knows, you know? Um, so, I mean, we have that aspect. Then we have, like, even when it comes down to photography, like you mentioned in your in, uh, introduction, in, yeah, uh, your, your, um, what you're mentioning about Sharbat Gul, this photograph of th this Afghan refugee child was on the cover of National Geographic. It's named like one of the most famous pictures of all times. Sharbat Gul is a refugee living in Rome, right? Like Steve McCurry currently in this like literal moment has a gallery in Paris. I mean, his subject matters are, you know, from the Soviet war to the civil war, Steve McCurry was president of Afghanistan, right? Um, I like, it, it's this weird relationship where it's like, we love his work, but it's like, mm, his subject matters do not see the fruits of, you know, of, of, of like their existence, because that's what he's capturing. Um, he's going on to sell these photographs, these galleries, he's getting tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars yet the people that he's documenting just continue to live you know in poverty uh so if we look at media that way we have hundreds and hundreds of talented afghan photographers uh doc documentary filmmakers um fil like just the whole gambit we have that yet you got steve mccurry being given the exhibit on afghanistan mm -hmm. right he has a whole book 
a whole photography book an published entire career, like an entire yeah career. yeah yeah you know our like Afghan existence yeah. put him on the map yeah gave, um, gave him a high rise in Brooklyn yeah yeah so I mean being with like in the film industry I've had a uh, I've had the privilege of you know getting in uh being uh, afforded pitches where I can pitch shows films to uh, production companies producers um and if I and I I've been there where I've tried to pitch um like whether it was a comedy or uh, a coming of age story of, of just an Afghan American who just yeah. happened to be Afghan who's going through turmoil it's like why would we if you're not going to heighten the Afghanness of this character yeah. we could just replace that character with another white character like why does your what would so unique well, like they want you to lean in. You can't just be an Afghan American. You got to be Afghan American wearing a pakol, you know, right. riding your horse to work or some shit, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't just be an Afghan. It has to be know? like a Kalashnikov somewhere there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, ha there it has to be very on the nose. Like yeah. just existing as an Afghan American is not enough, right? Right. So, um, and and you look at, you know, um, I mean, I don't know, like, I don't want to turn this into a let's bash on the United States Al type of show. But I mean, um, we, we, I mean, all of us here collectively have friends that work on that show, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but the problem is we can count on one hand all of our friends that we all collectively yeah. know that work on that show. But you look right. at a production like United States of Al, a production that has hundreds of crew members, right? Hundreds, if not like a hundred, uh, from like lighting to gaffing to sound to uh, a set design, prop design, uh, wardrobe, uh, camera, uh, like you, uh, post production producers, coordinators, whatever you, production assistant set. How many Afghans are there? Yeah. Right. Probably, I'm. I I know, but it's not. It's not more than a handful. Yeah. That work on the set, you know. So. Afghan story narrative. I mean, we're not even addressing the whole military political narrative of that show. We're just like talking the logistics aspect of it, right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I've I've been fortunate. I've had uh, my uncle. My uncle's a, a lawyer in uh, Southern California called Kaharun. He he put me in touch with this this production company that um, was looking for this eight well HBO uh, show that was looking for like writers to. Um, because it had an Afghan character in that mm -hmm. show. So um, they were looking for Afghan writers. And I was like, the three Afghan writers I know is working on United States of Al. Um, and this is something that like we need to look at, as Afghans, we need to look within house, like, you know, yeah. like really try to uplift our own Afghan writers uh, to be in these positions where we can like help one another up and give in, you know, and I was trying to, you know, do that. So I was I was fortunate where, where I I got this opportunity to to work with HBO uh, on this on this animated series that got real and comes out sooner than later, um, but if you look at the Afghan narrative and, and I'd love to hear Azita and Ariana and Medina your take on this but if we look at the Afghan narrative as a whole in media it's always centered around like military violence or the last twenty years of war right you're not going to have just like an Afghan American or just an Afghan in general that is not somehow like intertwined with um, yeah. with war or violence. You can't just be an Afghan baker in yeah. Kabul. You know, yeah. you got to be an Afghan baker whose mom, you know, like yeah, stepped on the like mine or something. And, you know, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so th that's been my, my gripe, you know, and um, and when, when these projects haven't been able to to get momentum, I'm just like at this point, like Ariana's like, I'll just do it myself. Yeah. And like, you know, like I like I was telling you guys last night, I'm trying to spearhead this like Mullah Nasser Dean project, this series that I, I want to do. I don't like at this point, I'm like, I want no other hand, but, you know, Abby and mm -hmm. like financing and funding. And so we can do this and tell our own stare, like our own fables and folklore, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's very removed from any kind of violence or war. And high yeah. Ways. But yeah, so I'd love to hear your take. So I'm. Um, the Afghan narrative that's always kind of based and surrounded around this war. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, just just kind of going back to like Sharbat Gola, yeah. so many things need to be highlighted. Like the fact that she was a child, she was not, you know, asked if she was she would be okay with this. Her father was not asked if he would be okay with it. 
it makes me think about the media ban that that Azita John was talking about, where it's like there's no consideration for the actual like desires and concerns and agency for Afghan folks. Yeah. Um, after the image was in the original Nat Geo um, article, her name wasn't mentioned. There was nothing about her. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think the caption said something like uh, Afghan woman's uh, Afghan girl's eyes show like fears of being a refugee or, or something along those lines. But later we, we come to find out that she said she was scared in that moment of Steve McCurry, like not of being a refugee. Um, and so it, it really makes me just kind of think about like how sometimes we Afghans ourselves, I don't think that we realize how much we're being disrespected. Um, and it's just something that that I really hope that we advocate more for ourselves and like respect ourselves more and demand more um, yeah. of kind of these bigger these bigger systems. Um, I just I just got a question. Um, I don't know if it mm -hmm. popped up with the other panelists, but I, I, it just popped up from mine. Uh, Sarah wrote this. Uh, she was asking, um, as an Arab American writing about problematic problematic narratives surrounding Afghan women, what should our role look like as Arab Americans, um, as for the all, all panelists, for all the panelists, uh, I, I would love, it, you know, as allies of Arab Americans or uh, Muslims that are writing uh, about the Afghan experience, write about it, reach out to Afghans, you know, be like, you know, highlight Afghans, quote Afghans, speak to Afghan women, um, you know, uh, I think the Afghan American uh, Federation, you know, they've put together a, a great, you um, list of Afghan professionals I can speak to media, you know, so um, Afghan American Foundation is, is great in compiling that. Afghan American Coalition is great at compiling list of Afghans within whatever field that you want to look at or speak to, you know, so. I mean, I have a different take. Sure. <laughs> um, I would say that's our story. I would say we should write our story right now because we know our story like I wouldn't write your story right now I was approached by a white filmmaker with a lot of access and he was like wanting to write a story about bin Laden and I just was like I basically was like um okay well you have to have Arabs I didn't say even Afghans like, you have to have Arabs on your team and luckily I was able to influence him to hire Arab writers, which is cool because then he's, they're going to have access because he has access. I mean, but I know that's extreme. Um, but also like what Ali was saying, like, I, I love that we have such a different, like for, I love that for you. It's like, not, it's, it's like, you're like, I just want to, why can't I just write a story about an Afghan family, you know, or like an Afghan doing whatever. And for me, especially in music, like being political actually makes it harder sometimes. Like uh, I, I sat in an interview and they're like, well, do you ever just want to write? It was my first album was, was pretty political. It was a lot about Afghanistan and made partly in Afghanistan. And, and the journalist was like, do you ever just want to write love songs? And I was like, oh, I do write some love songs, but it's like, uh, I was born in an Afghan body. And so I don't know. It's interesting. Also, when you guys are talking about United States of Al, like the conflict for me, for, well, first of all, it's not created by Afghans. And that's why you have some of the, the lack of nuance. And I mean, for me, it's like, I, I'm happy for every Afghan in that room. For Azita, who's a dear friend getting, like, I've known her for over a decade. And I'm so happy for her to have that, like, guest recurring role. And like, um, Cause I know as an actor, how insane it is to like hardly ever get to play Afghan. And then like all of the other things I mentioned earlier. And so it's just such a conflict, right? It's like, we should just, if there's enough space for us and we're, and we have the agency of our, of our narrative, then we wouldn't have to have these, these like either, or we wouldn't have to feel either or about any of this. We'd be like, yeah. there's, a spectrum of us we're not a monolith and I'm not saying that we shouldn't collaborate also to go back to like the, the Q&A like we should collaborate but like look at the moment we're in like the country just fell we're all in trauma and like I gotta be honest like a lot of the rest of the Muslim world have been silent and it's been super traumatizing for a lot of Afghans so there's just you know it's just we just need more 
we need to just be in the room more and I feel like we should be leading our narrative. Yeah, no, and definitely. Think, and, and we were talking, sorry, go, go ahead, Azita John. I was just gonna mention, I think it's also important just kind of bringing some of these points together really considering the intersections of oppression too, right? Like we all have, like, we understand very similar struggles in terms of war and US uh, involvement in our respective countries. And so I think there are points of connection um, to be able to work in allyship with one another. Uh, with that in mind, knowing that there are a lot of differences to our respective countries and our experiences. And so I think what can be really helpful is the collaborative process, uh, but of course, ensuring that we know whose voices need to be elevated in these conversations. Azita, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, we're, we're talking about how like Ariana is really wanting to tell a certain story that in incorporates the, the politicalness of her identity. And then Ali's like, dude, can I just like talk about Milan Asaridin? And we should be able to like do both and, and however we want. And you said yesterday, you said this like really awesome quote, and I wrote it down. You said like, we want, we want it to represent us so badly, but it never really can. And then you also talked about like plastic representation. Can you can you talk more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the scholar Kristen Warner refers to the increase of black visibility in American media as plastic representation. And so she argues that, quote, the diversity became synonymous with quantity of difference rather than the dimensionality of those performances. And so positive representations here replace that under or misrepresentation of groups, but in a matter that simplifies their complexities and does little to really combat those stereotypes of groups. So concerns around visibility or perhaps the lack thereof has led really to this moment of uncriti uncritical visibility wherein representation has become artificial, right? In other words, plastic. And so the representation of Afghans in US media oftentimes falls under under this larger umbrella of Muslim and brown representation, and which of course signals how people from the Middle East, South Central Asia are oftentimes viewed as this homogenous group. And so further, we see seemingly complex storylines and characters are often presented through these one dimensional portrayals that reinforce stereotypes oftentimes. And so the scholar Evelyn Asultani refers to this as simplified complex representations. So it's a practice that has become really common post 9-11 where in these negative representations of Muslims and Arab characters are accompanied by positive ones. So we have to balance it out, right? Kind of going back to Bush's um, uh, war speech about, uh, you know, there's, there are good Muslims too, right? Our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, right? And so it's this idea that, you know, not all Muslims are bad. So if there's a negative rest of the representation, let's try and equal it out with just one positive one. If there's a, a bad cop, then there should be a good cop too, right? And so we see exemplified here, recently with the sitcom, and I know uh, similarly to as uh, Ellie John and Medina, you mentioned in the, in the introduction, we can go on and on about United States of Al. And while I'm not going to spend too much time discussing the show, I think it's important to really discuss where concerns are rooted for folks, right? And so the representation of minority communities is so uncommon that when groups see their lives and experiences reflect in the media, we expect these specific programs to address systemic issues of misrepresentation, right? Like this show's got to do everything uh, because it's so far and few between. And so minority communities who do not have the same opportunities as the majority who may see them, their many selves really um, and experiences reflect in the media. And so this contributes to swift response and demand for di diverse portrayals related to representation of those who are oftentimes absent or infrequently portrayed with the media or misrepresented when they do appear in storylines. So, you know, producers, writers, and fans of the show suggest that, you know, those of us who are less happy with the new sitcom to give it a chance, right, to celebrate the first prominently featured Afghan character in network television. This is a move towards inclusion or whatever it may be, right? Uh, however, in this moment, we can also refer to uh, what Stuart Hall, his assessment of representation saying, quote, I know what replaces invisibility is a kind of carefully regulated, segregated visibility, right? So we want this show, United States of Al, to represent us so badly, but it never will, right? The lives and experiences of Afghans, like any group, are far too complex to be captured in one American sitcom program. And that's part of the, the issue, right? For a lot of folks, 
you know, if you're part of these majority communities, you can see yourself and envision yourself in so many different roles reflected with the media. You could be a lawyer, a bus driver, you know, it, it goes on and on. But for Afghans, we're oftentimes limited to war, right? Uh, being a refugee or so on. And so the challenge, challenging these systems would require the inclusion of complex characters and storylines that center their experiences and storylines that move beyond simply just war and really oppose the retelling of the US war in Afghanistan to comfort the American public too, right? And that's what we're starting to see in this moment is how can we retell the story of the war in Afghanistan? And that's where we've got a lot of work to do too. Yeah, absolutely. I think like, and I was telling, I was telling y'all last night when I started to do more research into the Pentagon and the Department of Defense's entertainment liaison office and like the the really intense relationship between Hollywood and and the DoD. Um, it just kind of makes me think about like like what you were saying, like it'll never represent us. This is a this is my belief, right? I'm talking me personally. I don't know that th that this will ever represent us because it's serving a purpose for America, right? And it's, and I don't know, like, that we'll be able to really have, like, truth tellers or um, it has to be pa palatable to the American public. Um, and it also has to, to, like, kind of do PR and clean up um, for, you know, really the disaster that was the war. Um, but there are some Q&As that I think we can open up. Let's see. I while you, yeah, while you look at the questions, I think, you know, we really need to ask, I mean, if we want to break away from this whole, like, having these Hollywood executives as gatekeepers for Afghan narratives, and if we're trying to look at independently sharing our own narratives, because um, that's the only way we kind of reclaim our own narrative, um, we have to look within our community and look at some of, you know, seek support from within the community. Um, you know, whether it's it's um, financial support on financing a lot of these artists that want to get, you know, uh, kind of break in. Because even right now, outside of just the Avian American artists, right now we have hundreds of Avians that have been recently uh, displaced from Afghanistan that are writers, animators, musicians. Um, they, we, they have a narrative of their own that they want to share. Um, so to my Avians that are watching, we have to have an in-house discussion after this, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And like yeah. when you were talking, Ali, like, like um, what's, what I think is really cool is like, I was thinking about our, our kind of, our different individual voices and paths in this panel. And like, um, I don't know, like, I'm like, my personality is like, I'm, I kind of get like a fighter and I'm like, nope, I'm doing it my own way. I can't, yeah. but there are people and I feel like you are good, probably much better at this than me, <laughs> like who can be in a room of like in a system and be able to kind of like push the room a little in like a way that's like, it just, I, we need everyone. We need people to be able, like, we need Afghans who can, can, who can do that. And then we also need like Medina John who's outside, like, nope, I'm starting a petition and we're shutting this film down. <laughs> like, yeah. We're shutting the film down. It's like, yeah. we need what I was saying, like, more. it's easy for me to do that because I'm not in the, in the room. Right. Like I was mentioning this last night, like I'm super critical of, of US of Al and just, you know, now this new Channing Tatum um, movie that's coming out, but I'm also like not working in Hollywood. It's easy for me to be on the outside and be like, I don't like that, fix this, this and that. But I'm also appreciative of the Afghans who are like, trying to be in those rooms and are trying to um, exercise as much agency as they can. And I can imagine that like, that's mentally draining, you know, it's mentally draining to constantly have to advocate for your people and feel like you have the pressure of like your country <laughs> on your back. Um, and so, so like, like, you know, you, you and Ali John are talking about really cultivating and like supporting each other too, um, because we are up against something that's like really large. Um, but go ahead, I like cut you off. Oh, no, and I, the last thing I was just gonna say is like, I saw in the question, a comments, like something about that the lead actor isn't even Afghan. And mm -hmm. even with that, I had um, a hard time, I was telling you guys last night, like, I didn't wanna say anything about that because the truth is, okay, so if he's Indian, like, I know what it's like for him too. 
like it's a rough it's rough like you're and, and that person who's also saying like how do we write you know the person on here who's not afghan but they're of the region it's so hard because we are all limited and and it's i don't know the answer forward of how we navigate in uplifting each other outside of our specific cultures and then seriously like all us afghans we just have to like we just have got to back each other up and i was talking last night in our call about like the iranian film industry like how yeah. solid that is or like indian cinema is like bigger than hollywood and like mm -hmm. if we can look at those models of like what are they doing like they all work together they put each other's maybe like you know for example like hey maybe alia like executive produced some other person's film or produced some other other person's project or you know we cross-pollinate yeah i also think like um because i do this a lot too when, when i'm thinking just just about anything afghan right like why can't we be like indians or like iranians or, or any other diaspora community and i also just think for us to remember that like we went through 40 years of war it's like very different circumstances yeah. we're a relatively new diaspora community compared to iranians and indians um and so i think like giving ourselves some grace it's gonna take time you know and yeah, it, like very yeah. similar to america's military entertainment industry as you quoted earlier um a lot of these nations or a lot of these countries have like government initiative mm -hmm. budget for filmmaking right um so you you have that and you know like um that that will support the arts yeah um unfortunately you know our uh, we we haven't had that luxury in afghanistan yeah. Um, I mean, they had like one theater that opened yeah. up in the last 20 years that, you know, I that was closed down now, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah. There is a question in the Q&A, and I think that this is something a lot of Afghans talk about too. It says, um, how do you guys feel about works like uh, Hosseini's The Kite Runner or A Thousand Splendid Sons? How do they contribute to uh, the narrative, him being an Afghan writer and how some consider it problematic? But yeah, I'd love to hear your take on this. <laughs> so, I mean, I like read both of those books in high school and it was like required reading, but obviously I also read it because he's an amazing writer, okay? Like storytelling, it's really beautiful. Um, but I think it, it does kind of just um, manufacture some type of idea. I think that there's like a lot of racist tropes about Pashtuns in, in his storytelling. Um, and so I think that that's definitely a problem. I also think that it can highlight real ethnic issues amongst Afghans too. Um, but I also think it's like, anytime I, I would tell people that I was Afghan, they'd be like, oh, like the kite runner. And like, that is like really irritating. Cause it's like, but also not like the kite runner. Um, well, I have so, a question. I have a question. Yeah. But it's so off, but I feel like it really. Yeah. How many of you guys have met a white person that's like, "Where are you from?" And you're like, "Afghanistan." I was like, "Oh, I served in Afghanistan." Oh and yeah, like, <laughs> so many like, times. What am I supposed to do with that information? Yeah, Thank you. You know? yeah. That that always like trips me out and makes me so uncomfortable because I'm like, I don't want to know about the horrible things you probably did in my country. Um, but yeah, I think like Khalid Husseini is is such a hot topic in the community, and I don't really know like how to how to approach it anymore. I just feel like there's so many more new opportunities and like new up and coming authors and like different media that we can focus on. Yeah. Well, like your poetry, Matina, you okay. know? So it's like, you know, you're a poet. And so yeah. it's like, everybody check out Medina's poetry. That's that's a way to counter that, right? Yeah. And, then, and then like uplift her. Right. Thanks, Ariana. Yeah. Um, so let's see, there's another question here. It says, uh, why are like, why are these bar why do these barriers exist? And then how can we break them? Why so we could do a whole other hour on that, but why do you think these barriers exist in Hollywood, y'all? <laughs> or just in media in general? Well, well I mean, story. oh, go ahead, Alicia. Oh, no, I would love to hear your stuff. Well, I, I was just going to mention that, like, you know, there's power in storytelling. So when you get to speak for yourself or when someone gets to speak for you, there's power in that. Um, and so the ability for 
someone to be able to speak for someone else that's controlling the narrative, right? Um, and that's being able to say that this is how we see this particular group and this is how everyone should, right? Who's engaging with this type of content. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, that, that brings to the forefront what we're talking about today, the importance of us being able to speak for ourselves um, because we do identify how important it is to have the keys and the resources to be able to tell our own stories because we know how important they are not just to us but to everyone else and you know kind of just touching upon like this previous question about kite runner right like we have to understand what appeals largely to folks and why um and you know why is it that there are so many limited folks on such a mainstream level that we can actually name who who are able to speak for for afghans too right um and just being able to open that up as well yeah, um, you know, we're a fairly new diaspora community in America, like Afghan Americans. We, uh, the bulk of us uh, families came here sometime in the mid to late 80s. Some of them came in the late 70s, but that's still not, you know, so, um, and being here new, it was just um, filmmaking is a very un, like, hasn't really fully been explored. The industry, not just filmmaking, the art, but like the business of like, Hollywood studios. So now it's like we, we have just a, literally a handful of Afghans within the studio system, you know, and we, we have individuals like Fahim Anwar and Hila Hamidi that are that are going in and, and, and you know, have, they have a foot in the door. And what's beautiful about them is not only do they have a foot in the door, and I think we should all kind of like take that. It's like, not only should we have a foot in the door, but we should hold it open and be like, you guys come in too, you know? So like, um, for example, like I was working on this HBO project and I was like, oh, we got to bring in Ali Olami, Professor Olami into this, you know, let's let's zoom him in, let's bring him on as a consultant, you know, like have many Afghans as I can like bring in, I'm going to try to do that, you know? Um, so I think I think that's one way that, that we can kind of like, you know, we, we just kind of kind of, grassroots it at the moment you know we have to first we have to identify this is an issue we are being spoken over we are being spoken for um we don't have control of our own narrative so i let's identify that issue now how do we solve this we got to bring in the avians train the avians avian editors producers writers actors comedians you know um and and that's how we do it and you know and it doesn't have to be very like again on the notes like uh, you know it doesn't have to be like this is like for example, I was, we were talking about it last night, uh, Fahim Anwar is an Afghan comedian uh, based in Los Angeles. Me and him have a podcast called The Dance Hour, Fahim Anwar Dance Hour, and we just talk about nothing at like, just our day, but it's always through like, a, we don't, it's not through an Afghan lens, but we just happen to be Afghan. And that is our perspective, you know? Um, so, um, you know, there was like an episode where just the two of us were trying to deconstruct Christmas and we didn't understand, and we didn't really give it much thought. We were just, just two random having us talking about Christmas. But like our listeners emailed in and are like, oh, this was a very fascinating perspective to hear Afghans not understanding or like you know, Afghan Americans. And I was like, oh, like I never even thought of it that way, but our audience who are non-Afghans are, are hearing it. So I think the way, and it, this kind of addresses another uh, question that we have in the Q&A, it's, um, you know, like how do we, um, complicate these narratives is just through that, just like kind of existing in these spaces. You know, I don't have to be an Afghan sipping uh, choy sabs with a pot colon, you know, uh, playing Amadoya to be like, I'm Afghan. I, no, I yeah, you do. You actually do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll throw in a lungi and a chapan as well, you know. <laughs> you know, like to piggyback on that, like, um, I love what you were saying about like, like bringing other people in when we get, when we get into doors and like, you know, first I want to say like I've had incredible, like I mentioned David Lynch and his wife Emily, and like I've had incredible mentors and incredible peers. You, if any of you guys are watching out there, like I've had great teams. Um, I've yeah, also, like they exist. They exist. Yeah, I've had like a lot of allies and peers and people who have have helped in so many ways. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm just focusing on the hard part, but I want to say like in the last few years I got hit up when I was younger. People like male white male filmmakers would hit me up and I was super young and maybe like I want to meet with you to talk about what's happening in Afghanistan because I had been going there and I was like great this, you for your yeah, this and yeah. this and this and this and then I'd leave the meeting and go wait a minute I'm the one living it I just gave all that information to some white dude who's gonna make this thing and like I got exploited 
And finally, in the last few years, I get hit up by white film filmmakers, predominantly male, to pick my brain. Literally, can I pick your brain? Or like I was at a dinner party and someone said something, this guy said something that sounded kind of offensive, a storyline, and I corrected it and was like, oh, well, actually, like expats who are non-Afghan, blah, blah, blah. And then he sends me an email and he's like, so I'm going to make this Afghan expat film. And I was like, wait, what? Yeah, like took <laughs> Just like took what I said in a dinner conversation, pitched it back to me. And now in the same email, can I pick your brain? And I had to like sit there and go, how am I going to respond to this? And it was like, well, you can hire me to consult or you could bring me on as a co-writer or producer. I mean, it's just, and, and so now that's how I have to respond. Sometimes it shocks people, but it's like, if they're going to make a story about our people, like some, one of us at least has to be a writer, a producer, not just like an assistant, right. you know, like, and, and I, and I'm actually very glad that some people on, on the bigger projects are coming in that are more corporate as an assistant. Cause I know that that's another, that is a pretty rigorous like road, but if someone's making an independent project or like slightly smaller and they're like just wanting to get your ideas like you need a you need a role you need a title or you need to be paid or both or whatever and you need to sit with yourself like before that conversation and ask yourself what is this story I got one woman who was like I want to make this film like I was like I had a conversation with an Afghan refugee and I felt really unsafe like um because I've had experiences with Muslim men and I was just like she's like can you look at my story and I was like no I can't I can't believe you're making this story and she's mad and I was like I can't believe you're making this story I don't want to look at this story I can't believe this story exists right now <laughs> that was it <laughs> so anyway just want to um ask. can you share the Rambo story please oh Ali why don't you start with talking about <laughs> oh yeah no it's um Rambo you know like we if you look at like stories about Afghanistan, films about Afghanistan, it dates back to the 80s. Like, I, I'm sure there's films earlier than Rambo. I'm unfortunately not a cinephile film bro, a historian to know, but I know from my extended kind of my earliest recognition of Afghans in media was Rambo. And um, I'm not going to drop the fact that I gave you guys last night, but, you know, like every Afghan kind of grew up with the VHS of Rambo 3 because, you know, Rambo took down the Soviet Union single-handedly, you know? Uh, of course, another white savior trope. I mean, all that, but it's still a, it's still Rambo, man. We all love it, you know? Yeah, um, I do. But it's funny how I never knew how it came about until we talked about it last night. Mm -hmm. So he's telling that story and I'm like, oh my God, my late mom who passed a year and a half ago, um, she was young and, or I mean, relatively young, she had kids, but like in the eighties, she was like an assistant in Hollywood and she pitched to, I believe it was Warner Brothers, like to whoever put out Rambo, she like a pitch to them, hey, you guys should do a Rambo on Afghanistan. And they just took her idea and and made it without her. So, you know, it just, um, it was funny yeah. that it came up last night. I was like, oh yeah, and that, like that's oh, really- Oh, Ariana's cool. mom basically pitched Rambo, you guys. That, that's, that's, Rambo that's amazing. Rambo. You know, it even goes like as far back as you, I mean, again, 30 plus years ago, you look at Rambo and you look at a film that it's funny in an ironic way. It was a film about Soviet occupation and Afghans dying while the war was still going on. It wasn't yeah. like the war ended and the Soviet Union got out of it. It was still going on. And it was like, let's make a movie about this. Okay. Um, and then on top of that, I don't, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure not a single Afghan was kind of in the film. Maybe they threw some in the background, but given its location of filming it in the Middle East and not in Central Asia, right. I doubt they had access to Afghans. And that's just been a continuation. And you, we still see it till today, you know, whether yeah. it's any of these Marvel films or Iron Man or whatever, Lone Survive, like Zero Dark. I mean, we don't even, like, the, it, the problem is, if these movies exist, the only roles for Avian is terrorist number one and two. And no one, I mean, like, I don't even want Avians to go in that realm, you know, but if like, if that's the only thing available and they go, whatever, I'm not, um, but they just kind of paint us, they'll put like Pakistanis playing Avians, they'll put Iranians, Arabs. Kite, we, we talked about Kite Runner a minute ago. They made a movie about Kite Runner. The main character 
like the older, whoever the guy was, uh, I can't remember his kid, the main character's name. Main character was Egyptian playing, yeah. uh, you know, the, the father was Iranian. The, the guy goes back to Afghanistan in the 90s to fa- rescue the kid. His, his driver, his friend is Moroccan. Mm-hmm. Or a Moroccan, you know, French guy playing, playing Afghan. So, it, you know, it, you just kind of look at um, how this Orientalism still kind of exists where we're all just, we're all the same. Brown's all the same across the board from literally Morocco to India. Yeah. yeah. There's one paintbrush of the same ethnic culture, background, you know, even faith. Right. Um, and it's Afghanistan. Like, it's, yeah. It's like, I'm sorry to go on. I'll leave. No, I mean, like, we were talking about how, like, there isn't one Afghan and there isn't a one Afghanistan. You know, Afghanistan's a nation that speaks multiple languages, not just Farsi Pashto, there's Azari, there's Nurstani, there, there's so many different languages that are spoken within Afghanistan. Um, and then there's so many religious backgrounds, you know, historically that are in Afghanistan. So it's not just a Sunni and Shia, you know, Muslims. There's, I can, there's countless atheist Afghans. There's countless Buddhists, Hindu Sikhs, Sikhs, Jews. Hindus, yeah. Jews. Yeah, you know, uh, Zoroastrians. Yeah, you know. Um, so Afghanistan is as multicultural as any other like nation in the world. Right. And I think that that's the difficult part is like, we also know all of these nuances and we're, and I feel like it, it feels a little bit like we're scrambling, right? Like wanting yeah. to be able to showcase that, but at the same time, it's really difficult. Um, in the interest of time, we're, we're about to hit 12 o'clock. I did want to open up a discussion on like solutions and kind of moving forward. Um, and Azita, John, if you could start off for us, you mentioned like alternative spaces. And then I we have the okay to go until 1210, just so you guys know, or 1210 my time. Great. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, as we've been hearing throughout this conversation today is just that we need more Afghans, right? In every part of the production and not just Afghans or those who look Afghan uh, to give these productions a sense of like, you know, authenticity or whatever it may be. Um, our stories for so long have been told by others and we see the results of it, right? How we've been represented, whether that's in news or entertainment media. And there are many talented Afghans, right? Many on this call today um, that I'm so lucky to be a part of in, in conversation with you all because I appreciate everything that you've been doing in this profession too. Um, um, thinking about how uh, we've, you know, you've been curating these spaces independently too, that some folks are making their way into more exclusive mainstream spaces. And that's going to be really important for us when we think about entering, you know, uh, different places. But I think there's also a, a real big importance in like these alternative spaces and thinking that it's not necessary that like, you know, we're trying to get uh, a show on ABC or Netflix or whatever, like that's wonderful and that could be part of it. But I think it also really comes down to uh, what we need for us too, right? Um, so it's, uh, I think it really uh, centers like who are our imagined audiences for our work as well. Um, and sometimes, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be in these big budget places, but we can also have these really important spaces that are meaningful to us too. Um, and I think that'll be important for us as we move forward as well. Yeah, definitely. Ariana, do you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, like what you just said, like um, my, our friend, um, Maryam Argandiwal, who might be listening, like one time we were talking and she said something really cool when, when, when she was talking about her personal journey as a writer, like she's like, we should write, uh, she was, she was referencing someone else and I don't know who it was, who was, you know, also a person of color saying like, let's create for us you know, instead of creating for others. And so I just, that, that stayed Boo boo, with- for us, by us. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and, and I also think, I think about like Rami and like all of these different, you know, it doesn't have to be like big Hollywood stuff, but it, that can definitely like open up doors for us. Um, but if, and if no one else has any um, other comments that you want to add in terms of like wrapping up and solution, um, and solutions. There are a lot of like cool questions in the q and I don't know that we'll have time to get to them. Um, but I wanted to thank all of you for joining today's panel. It's been so, um, it brings me a lot of hope 
I think I like stay in this like very pessimistic realm when it comes to Afghans and representation and, and Hollywood. I think we have a really unique opportunity right now. Um, and I also think like the Afghan diaspora is growing. We're, we're gonna have so many more of our, of our family members and folks coming here too, who are, a lot of them are working, wor worked in the arts in Afghanistan. And so that's gonna be really awesome to be able to incorporate those folks too. Um, and so I think moving forward, we have a very unique opportunity and I hope that we can continue to support and uplift each other. Um, wanted to send it back to Joseph to wrap up. Um, thanks, Medina and Azita, Ali and Ariana for um, the perfect close to our summit. Um, so this was four days of, of conversations with people ranging from the folks on this call to national security experts to people doing on the ground resettlement work. Uh, and, and I hope that um, the hundreds of people who registered um, really go back and re-listen to some of these conversations, because I think there's a lot of um, reason for hope to Medina's point, but also a call to action. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on all of these fronts, including this one. And so I hope both Afghans and non-Afghans who um, participated um, do something with the great information and the investment these folks have made in being here. Um, I wanted to thank um, MPAC for its partnership um, especially two interns, um, Lubna Heikel and Sanila Tamiz. Um, they actually did a lot of the labor of putting this together and we're really grateful for that at AAF. Um, the panels are gonna be available on MPAC's national YouTube channel. So if you'd like to receive a copy of the summary report, um, you can email them at hello at MPAC and you can go to the YouTube channel and see these, um, these sessions anew. Um, and I think the most important thing I'd wanna say on behalf of the African American Foundation is that um, we need to do more of this. Um, for a long time, um, we had to fight to, to create space and hold space, and now we have organizations like MPAC and others that are um, willing to help us do that. Um, so at the very least, I hope this is the beginning of a number of discussions that we'll have um, as this crisis continues. Um, I think I wouldn't be doing uh, my community service if I didn't um, mention the fact that there is an ongoing humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan right now. 25 million people are on the, the precipice of starvation. Um, there's an economic collapse that has already started. The healthcare system is collapsing and people are currently suffering. So if nothing else um, that you got out of these sessions today in the last four days, I would implore you to reach out to your members of Congress, um, reach out to your friends in corporate America, anybody of influence, anybody who has the ability to raise their voice uh, in alliance with support of the people of Afghanistan and those who are reselling in the US, do that. The time is now. So again, with thanks for our panelists uh, and really a lot of gratitude for the team at MPAC. Um, we wanna bring this to a close uh, and we look forward to seeing you next time.